Hey guys, it's Mrs. Benson again. We're gonna start chapter one of our book. I just got back from lunch. Make sure there's nothing in my teeth. Nice. This chapter takes place in China. Okay, so here's China. Remember we talked a little bit about Singapore, which is down here. Um, China is across the Pacific Ocean from the United States as well. And Shanghai, the city we're gonna talk about today, is right on the coast here. Right here is Shanghai. All right, so let's get started. I may stop from time to time to explain things to you, but if you wanna grab your books and start reading with me, that'd be great. So the first chapter, chapter one, Adventure in Shanghai. It all started at the Shanghai Dog Kennels in Shanghai, China in February, 1936. My mother was one of the finest English pointers in the city, and I looked just like her. My face was almost entirely brown and my body was white with lots of brown spots. I was born in the English run dog kennels, which meant that as soon as I was big enough, one of the English families living in Shanghai would bring me home. So here's a picture of her right on the cover. So the English families that lived there and worked there loved these dogs. So when she was old enough, she was gonna go live with an English family. English families tended to be from Great Britain and if you remember, Great Britain was on our side in World War II, okay? All right, it all started, oh, sorry. The English loved Chinese tea, silk, and other goods. So there were a lot of English people living in the country at that time, working for companies that shipped those goods back to Great Britain. They tried hard to make China feel like home, which included having dogs as pets. Pointers are very playful, especially with children, and we also make great gun dogs. Gun dogs point, they use their little paws to point, to game, which is what they're hunting, when their humans are hunting. We're much better at that than humans could ever be. To be perfectly honest, humans' noses don't work very well. That's why humans need dogs. My sense of smell is about 100,000 times more powerful than yours. Wow. At three weeks old, I was at the kennel waiting for my real life to begin. I was ready for adventure and tired of being kept in a cage. The excitement of Shanghai was just a few feet away. Rickshaws, which are carts that people ride in, cars, bicycles, food carts, horse flies, shops, and people. And best of all were the smells, so many of them. And I wanted to investigate them all. So when no one else was looking and my brothers and sisters were busy crowding around mom, I wiggled my nose under the wire. Uh oh. Then I wiggled some more. And then I popped right through the wire fence and onto the street. Uh oh, Judy escaped. This is not good. It was amazing. I ran from one smell to the next, checking everything out, dodging rushing feet and rolling tires. A fly landed on my nose and took off. I chased it, but it was too fast for my pudgy little legs. A few people stopped to pet me, but a food cart vendor gave me a shove when I tried to check out his wares, meaning his food. That made me realize I was hungry and it was starting to get cold too. I was ready to go home, but I couldn't remember where home was. I had dashed here and there from one smell to the next without paying any attention. What am I going to do? I whimpered, hoping someone would stop and help. No one did. I lifted my nose and sniffed a big sniff, hoping to follow the scent of the kennels. <laughs> the warm, delicious smell of puppies and my mother and the humans who took care of us. But there were too many other smells crowding around me. I was lost, I was scared, I was cold, but mostly I was hungry. I have to fill my belly, I realized, then I can find home. So I searched for food. Garbage heaps turned out to be the best place to find a snack. And once in a while, a nice human slipped me a handful of rice. Even so, I could never fill my belly and I never did find home. Days went by and then a week or two, and I was hungry all the time. I wandered around the city searching for food and a cozy place to live. Not all of the humans I ran into were nice, and I started to think I would never find a safe place. 
But then I found Mr. Sue standing by the back door of his shop. Hello there, he said, reaching down to pet me. You look hungry, little one. I trained my big brown eyes on him and wagged my tail to say, I'm hungry, I like you. Mr. Sue went back inside and I was afraid that he wouldn't come out again, but he did. And he had food. He gave me a small handful of rice and fish from his lunch. I've learned that not only did Mr. Sue love dogs, but he also had a small store full of all kinds of interesting things. He sold stuff mostly to the British and American sailors that were all over Shanghai. At that time, Shanghai was full of Westerners. So they considered people like from the United States, Westerners. It's a port city on China's coastline that sits at the mouth of the Yangtze River, Asia's longest river. England, America, and France all had businesses in the country. But because warlords and pirates sailed the Yangtze, those countries sent gunboats, boats with guns on them, to patrol the waters and keep the merchant ships safe. So that pirates actually would come onto those ships and take over the ships and take everything on the ship. So they had to have these gunboats to protect them, kind of like police. I stayed with Mr. Sue for a few weeks after that. He fed me scraps of his own meals every day and he let me sleep in a box in the alley behind his shop. Sometimes he let me in the store and I helped him wait on sailors. Mr. Sue saved my life. Shanghai was a dangerous place for a dog like me and I was safe in his shop. I still patrolled the neighborhood looking for extra scraps, but I was grateful to have a box to sleep in and a kind human to visit every day. I thought that might, might be my life from then on, but another danger made itself known, Japanese soldiers. Japan's ships, like England's and America's, sailed up and down the Yangtze River and Japanese, Japanese soldiers patrolled Shanghai and often got into fights with the English and Americans. I had learned to recognize Japanese sailors pretty quickly after I escaped from the kennel, mostly because they always kicked me. And tonight, there was a whole group of them yelling and throwing things around Mr. Sue's shop. I just want to show you on our list here. So, Japan was not on our side in World War II, but France that they're talking about in Great Britain or England is another name for Great Britain or English soldiers and the United States were all on the same side. And so the J Japanese sailors that were in Singapore were not on the side of Singapore because Singapore is really close to China and Singapore and Great Britain are allies, okay? So those Japanese sailors were not happy with the people on the island of Singapore or the people in China. Okay. Oh, uh, let's see, where was I? Mr. Su tried to get them to stop. When he did, they started to hit him. He was already on the floor bleeding when I ran through the back door into the shop. The Japanese sailors knocked over shelves, breaking everything and then stomping on the pieces. I tried to run to Mr. Sue's side, but the sailors spotted me. One gave me a kick and another threw something at my head. Then a third one grabbed me by the neck and carried me outside. I yelped partly because I was in pain and partly to attract attention, but no one had time to come to my rescue. That sailor kicked me across the street and into a pile of garbage. I heard them all laughing as they left the shop. Neighbors ran to help Mr. Sue, but no one saw me or came to help. My stomach hurt and I was scared. I was afraid someone would come along and step on me. So I limped into an empty doorway and curled up. Poor Judy. It was dark. I shivered and cried from the cold and the fear and the pain while I watched the sky slowly change from black to purple to pale gray. I sniffed around, I sniffed the air around me, hoping for the smell of food or Mr. Sue. But instead, there was another smell I recognized, Li Ming. Li Ming's mother worked with Miss Jones, the English lady in charge at the Shanghai Dog Kennels. The little girl used to come and visit and play with my brothers and sisters and me. I liked her. 
I lifted my smout, snout, that's their nose, to smell her good, friendly smell, and I started to cry harder in the hope that she would hear me. The next thing I knew, she was kneeling in front of me. Even with just a human nose, she recognized me right away. Shooty, oh shooty, where have you been? Li Ming asked. I tried to thump my tail as a way to say hi, and I've missed you, and Japanese soldiers are mean, but I hurt too much. Li Ming picked me up gently and wrapped me in her raincoat. I had no idea I was so close to the kennels and regular meal time, meals all this time, but we were home in minutes. She brought me straight to Miss Jones, so she's back where she belongs. Look who I found, Li Ming said. Goodness, is that our missing pointer, Miss Jones asked. Then she said, wonderful, wonderful words. I think we should give her a bath and a good dinner. Those are wonderful, wonderful, wonderful words. They got no argument from me. Although I would have changed the order of things and had a good dinner first and then the bath. Lee Meng and Miss Jones were very grateful. They cleaned me up, fed me, and made sure I wasn't seriously hurt. Lee Meng could tell I didn't like all the poking and prodding. She wrapped me in a blanket and held me in her arms. I stayed awake only long enough for them to make my name official. You're okay there, little, little shooty, Lee Ming said. Why did you call her shooty? Ming, Miss, jo Miss Jones asked. Shooty means peaceful, Ming told her. Look at her, doesn't she look peaceful? She does, Miss Jones said. Then that will be her name, Judy. So they took the name shooty and they kind of made it more like an English sounding name, Judy. So from then on, I, called Ju I was called Judy, and it wasn't long before I was back to my old self, plump, shiny, and ready for fun. My mother and my siblings had all gone on to their human homes, but there were other dogs for me to play with and warn about the dangers in the outside world. Stay away from Japanese sailors, I warned them, and anyone with hungry eyes. We all agreed that eating dogs was a horrible, no good thing to do. Sometimes they eat dogs in China. Luckily, we were all in a place with humans who loved dogs and would make sure we went to good homes. Now that I was healthy and well fed again, I began to wonder what mine would be like. I was almost six months old when my next adventure began, but I didn't escape the kennels again. This time I was chosen. Remember I said English gunboats patrol the Yangtze River? The Nat was one of those ships and it was nearly perfect. There was just one thing missing, a mascot, just like we have mascots at our school. So while the ship was docked in Shanghai to get fixed up and collect supplies, Lieutenant Commander J. M. G. Waldgrave, the ship's captain, called a skipper, and Chief Petty Officer Charles Jeffrey set out for the Shanghai dog kennels to find one. So I kind of wrote a list of the different ranks that you'll read about in this chapter. The first is Lieutenant Commander, and that's the ship captain. He's kind of the boss of the ship, and they'll call him Skipper. The next thing in, in rank lines is First Lieutenant, and they're just below the captain. So the captain's the boss, and they're kind of like the second in command. Chief Petty Officers, if you look up Chief Petty Officer, in the rank of all the rankings in the Navy, they're the seventh. Um, and this quartermaster that we're gonna read about shortly, they're also a chief petty officer and they help to steer the boat and they give the signals. And then a seaman, which we'll also talk about in this chapter is the lowest rank. So they get kind of the jobs that have to do with cleaning and um, things like that. And they're like a sailor, your basic sailor. They're kind of the lowest in the ship, okay? All right. They had three requirements. There were only men on the ship, so they wanted a girl to balance things out. So they wanted a girl dog. They wanted that girl to be a beauty, and they wanted a dog that was able to earn her keep, so someone that could help them out. Jeffrey took one look at me and let out a slow whistle. You can't blame him. I'm a beautiful pointer. So they thought I would make a good hunting dog. So remember, she's a really pretty dog. 
I already liked Jeffrey's smell, and when I heard him whistle, I jumped right into his arms. The next thing I knew, I was an official member of the British Royal Na Navy. So remember, Great Britain's on our side, and the British Navy is, you can see British or Britain, that's the Navy for Great Britain. So all of a sudden, she's going to be on a ship for the British Royal Navy. That very afternoon, I went to live on the HMS, short for His Majesty's ship, Nat. So the G is silent. Like other gunboats, the Nat was small and fast and able to maneuver in the Yangtze. Some had big guns on her deck and even a couple of anti-aircraft cannons. The skipper and the chief petty officer brought me aboard and hid me in a small room with the quartermaster. And remember the quartermaster is the one in, in, responsible for steering and the signals on the ship. Then I heard someone say, all hands on deck in 10 minutes. Sailors pulled on their uniforms and crowded onto the deck. One of them, a first lieutenant, so first it's the skipper and then the first lieutenant is the next one important on the boat, climbed onto a wooden crate and made an announcement about how shooting parties going ashore to hunt would have to come back with more than just one duckling in the future. So they let the guys out to go hunting, but if all they're coming back with is one little duck, that's not really helping them at all in terms of food for their boat. He turned and yelled, quartermaster. The quartermaster led me out onto the deck. There were a few whistles and then a big cheer. I gave all the sailors my biggest smile while I waved my tail. Here she is, gentlemen, the first lieutenant said. Meet the first lady of the gunboats, Judy R.N. That's short, short for Royal Navy. I was official. So Judy R.N., Judy Royal Navy. I raised my snout and tried to look as first ladyish as possible. So she's trying to look important. But it's hard to look dignified when you're as happy as I was at that moment. I had an exciting new life in front of me, one that was going to be full of adventure, nice humans, and most important, food. Able seaman Jan Tanky Cooper was named the keeper of the ship's dog. So Jan Tanky Cooper is going to take care of Judy. Tanky was in charge of the ship's food and freshwater tanks. He was also the ship's butcher, which meant lots of bones for me. I loved Tanky, but really I belonged to the whole ship. It wasn't long before I knew every nook and cranny on the gnat and every sailor too. It was a good life. I had plenty of chow, which is food, and lots of juicy bones. There was always someone around to play with. And if I didn't feel like sleeping in my comfy blanket filled box on the ship's deck, I could always curl up with one of the sailors so he could sleep with the sailors on the boat too. The skipper and the chief petty officer, along with Tanky, did their best to, to train me for the gun. When they took me on shore, I was supposed to go rigid and point whenever I scented a duck, a quail, another kind of bird, an antelope, or gazelle in the woods around the Yangtze. So when he could smell those animals, he would stop and point and let the hunters know that there was one around. Well, it turned out I wasn't very good at that. I was only good at pointing at one thing, the ship's galley when dinner was being cooked. So this isn't a very good hunting dog. By the time the HMS Nat left Shanghai in November 1936, everyone accepted that I was a ship's dog and not a gun dog, not a very good hunter. My training started too late for me to be able to learn that now. I'd have to prove myself useful in other ways if my curiosity didn't get me into trouble first. There's the end of chapter one.